Go ahead. Thanks. Hey, good. I'll start from the beginning. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so anyway, so we were thinking within the police department, um, there's some some issues such as the staffing issue that's not going to solve overnight. So we can't just sit around and do nothing. Um, so we need to start leveraging technology in various ways around the department to try to help maintain the quality of service that we're providing the community. So this is just one piece of, of dots of different technologies out there. So this is a very specific technology. It uses a drone that's pre-positioned on top of a building in a particular location to respond to 911 calls, generated calls, or police generated calls for service only. So it's not patrolling, it's not doing any surveillance, it's not just cruising around looking for what might be going on in the community. It sits and it waits for a, a, a resident, a community member, a, a passerby to call 911 and alert us of an emergency or a police officer in the course of their duties identifying some type of emergency. And the goal is, is to arrive prior to, or worst case in conjunction with, first responders on the ground. And by getting there first, we can provide better information. We can allow for better decision-making of officers while they're on the way. Frequently, we're able to even cancel police officers, like, hey, you don't even need to come here. Um, so, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, later in the presentation. But uh, we have another uh, piece of this is to, to help de-escalate situations, uh, which we've done as well uh, so far. So basically how it works is there's a drone. You'll see the purple building here is a building, let's say, in downtown Silver Spring or downtown Wheaton. There's a drone that is parked on top of a high-rise building, and there's a person on that roof to make sure that everything is safe. And when it takes off, the sky is safe and things like that. And everything's controlled out of a central operations room in Rockville. And when a 911 call comes in, the drone can be sent to the emergency. The video uh, will stream um, re relative to that emergency and information can be shared with, with officers that are responding. Um, some of the reasons we, we were looking at this technology was when you call 911, it takes on average about two minutes and 33 seconds to process that information. So by the time you call 911, they ask you a bunch of questions and it gets sent over to a dispatcher to send an officer, could be on average around two minutes, sometimes a little bit faster, sometimes it takes longer. We found, especially with our um, communities that speak different languages, sometimes it takes longer because the call taker has to phone in an interpreter. So those process times can be longer. And what we're able to do in the drone room is hear the 911 calls live when they come in. So as soon as a call taker answers and says, you know, what's the location of the emergency, we're hearing that. That purple bar there that says 13 seconds, the average answer time, as soon as the phone's answered within those 13-ish seconds, the drone room can hear the emergency. And that allows us to send the drone right away if it's a call that meets our criteria and get there before officers are even dispatched in many times. Um, you see on the other side, once a police officer is dispatched, uh, 3D is Silver Spring. It could take them almost five minutes to get there, depending where they're coming from on average. So uh, we're getting there. The drone's getting there within a minute, a uh, minute and a half, depending where you're located in our area. And we're getting information very rapidly. Uh, this is a program that we use. I just said this is called Live 911. I took this picture when we were in Beverly Hills. We did extensive research prior to pitching the um, idea here in Maryland. And uh, basically, when you call, your location shows up, and then we can hear the call. Uh, we can only hear it. We can't do anything else with it, um, but it helps us to respond faster. So and essentially, the this is the drone that we use. Um, you know, it's... Uh, about 20 pounds and it, it flies for about 55 minutes and we fly about anywhere between 300 and 400 feet above the ground so it's it's uh, not really noticeable it's not creating a lot of noise that's disturbing the community anything like that when we fly to and from these emergency calls the camera is not recording and it's pointed upward uh, we want to to have the least amount of intrusion visually into people's uh, uh, privacy so it's the cameras coming down when we're on the scene or in the area of a crime. If the crime is mobile, the camera will come down. We then start recording the video and then we use the camera just related to the emergency. And then the recording stops, the camera goes back up and it flies back um, to where it took off from. 
So this is what our site looks like in, in Silver Spring. So we have a landing pad on top of a building and the drone sits there like you see here and it's in a ready state. And essentially the person on the roof has some technology up there that allows it to launch. And once we get an emergency, we, we input that information into the system and the rooftop person, um, if it's safe, permits the launch and then the drone will fly to the emergency. This is uh, just a picture of our operations room. This is a little bit of a dated picture, but uh, we have different computers and different databases and, and things that we can um, share information with patrol officers and the fire department. We've, we've responded to emergencies that in, needed fire rescue, and we were able to share information with them, like where a fire was located or potentially where people in need of medical assistance may be in relation to a a frantic 911 caller that was having trouble giving an exact location. So we were able to do that kind of stuff. Uh, this is what it looks like in Chula Vista, uh, more so what our space looks like now, a little bit more um, built up and professionalized. Uh, one of the things that um, Chula Vista was able to do was respond to these calls very quickly. This was a case where a subject was, um, someone called 911 and said that a person had a handgun. So the officers are responding. They have this mindset of there's somebody with a gun. Um, so they're responding in that mindset. The drone gets there first and zooms in and sees that um, this person, it looks like a gun, but it's actually a hand lighter. So the officer here flying the drone was able to relay that to the officers. The picture on the bottom left is the officers by the telephone pole. It might be a little hard to see, but the drone is able to say to them, all right, slow down. I'm watching the guy. You don't need to come out with your guns pointed, yelling, um, the guy's hands are empty, and they were able to make a softer approach and just do that investigation. And we had a similar situation in downtown Silver Spring where uh, an individual was manipulating a cell phone, pointing it at people in a fashion that someone holding a handgun would be pointing. Um, and and the, the, they're in the stance of, uh, of someone, a shooter stance, as we would call it. So we got there first with the drone and we were able to zoom in and see that it wasn't a gun. It was actually a cell phone. And we were able to relay that information to officers and allow for that de-escalated response. And what we like to call a more uh, softer investigative approach, no yelling, no guns pointed, things of that nature. So we're seeing some of those similar um, successes on our, on our side, as well as California having those as well. We've had other cases of a subject armed with a knife, uh, on Ellsworth Drive, and, and we got there, and the person did not have a knife in their hand, so we were able to relay that information and reduce the intensity of the officer's response, which keeps everybody safe. Um, this is the Chula Vista's dashboard. I'm going to breeze by this because I'm going to show you our own dashboard, and um, actually, I'm going to just step out from here for a second, and I'm actually going to bring up our own. So we have... Oh, sorry, the little toolbar on the top is in my way. There we go. We have our own um, website here at the Montgomery County Police website. So this is our drone as first responder program. You can find it just by Googling Montgomery County Police DFR, clicking the how do I tab and clicking on DFR. It's also under our data um, section. There's a link and essentially, it gives you our goals of our program, which this is the goals of the DFR, improve police response times. So we are seeing that. Uh, thus far, we've been, we officially started this pilot in November, and we are seeing improved police time, uh, response times. You'll see on the dashboard uh, that we are um, seeing average response times of between 52 and 68 seconds, so around a minute. Uh, of getting on scene of an emergency, um, allowing MCPD to be more efficient with our resources. Uh, we are seeing that. On the dashboard, you'll see DFR deployment avoided dispatching a patrol unit. That's 74 calls that the drone got there before a police car was even dispatched. And we were like, hey, police aren't needed here. We'll take care of it. Uh, we have a protocol for how we can take care of that and officers were allowed to be redirected to uh, another call or an emergency or activity. What's not captured on this dashboard, because this dashboard pulls data straight from our computer-aided dispatch system, there are times when officers are dispatched to a call, and we get there and we cancel them while they're on their way. Um, so 
in this statistic, it says avoided dispatching a patrol unit. There are times where a unit was dispatched and then we were able to cancel them. So that is a separate statistic that we track uh, in-house. And then we're able to merge those two uh, when we provide, we've provided um, some quarterly data to the county council. We're getting ready to create a 2024 first quarter uh, report that will be put out publicly, which will have all of this data on this dashboard. And then all the data that's not on the dashboard will be published uh, along with individual case examples that correspond with the various goals of the program for the public to be able to review uh, and digest at their leisure. Um, the real-time information to ground officers to allow better decision-making, I gave some examples to that already. The de-escalation, we've talked about that. Uh, assisting with locating and apprehending criminal suspects. That's not on this particular dashboard. That is something that we do track. Uh, we've located people that were involved in various calls, uh, you know, from assaults to shootings to thefts to car thefts uh, to breaking into cars. Uh, over 160 uh, different individuals have been located by the drone, which has allowed police officers to interact with them um, obtain stolen property that was taken from victims, make arrests, um, you know, maybe not make arrests if there's a better diversion that can be done. So we don't, you know, we don't say that, oh, we found a person, you need to arrest them. We just locate them. And then the officer has the discretion. Maybe the person doesn't warrant arrest. Maybe they warrant mental health uh, assistance instead, right? So not everyone that the drone finds is getting charged with crimes. Uh, that's why we we will use the term locate instead, because we want to give flexibility to what happens to a person after they're interacted with law enforcement. And many times it does not necessitate an arrest. Obviously, for some of the serious crimes like shooting and auto theft and breaking into cars, it does. But some of our lower level offenses that we respond to, uh, trespassings, disorderlies, disputes, disturbances, um, they can be handled without uh, any arrests or, or criminal charges being levied against a person. Uh, we track our first on scene count. So we're averaging a little over 70%. It fluctuates 70, 71%, uh, depending on the drone being at a call first. Now, why is that not 90% or 95%? Um, because there are times where we're being requested by officers to assist. So obviously we're not there first because the police officer is. So we had an officer one night say, hey, I think I just saw someone break into a car. I'm trying to watch them. Uh, it's dark. Um, could the drone come assist? So we responded to that police call, generated call for service of a crime in progress. And we were able uh, to observe individuals that were breaking into vehicles. They were uh, able to be safely uh, apprehended through our assistance in providing information on where they were, which allowed the officers to strategize the a safe, the safest place to interact with them. Um, and then they ended up having handguns concealed uh, in their waistband. So they were breaking into cars and they were armed with, with uh, illegally possessed firearms. Um, so that was um, a time where we weren't first on scene, but we did, uh, we did assist. So uh, a little bit of an overview here. Obviously we, we put on our website an email address and a phone number for folks that, um, need to contact or would like to contact the program. Obviously, my information um, is available for any of you all if you have questions. And so the other thing we have here is uh, right here, we have our launch flight maps and data. And what that does is it brings up our dashboard. Every flight that the drone flies has to be linked to a police case and incident number that uh, shows and confirms to the public that we are only flying actual police emergency calls. They're all linked with an incident number. And then we publish uh, the locations. If it's a, a residence, we will use a more general address, the 2000 block instead of someone's actual physical house address. And in this case, we responded to an assault in the 2000 block of Parker Avenue, uh, which is in our fourth district, Wheaton. It was an assault call. Uh, this particular call was a, uh, a subject armed with a knife, uh, stabbed an individual, and the drone was there first and located the subject in the neighborhood and was able to facilitate a safe apprehension. So we will put, uh, sometimes it's just the, de the description is just the crime. There was really nothing eventful that really came out of it. 
Um, we tell our staff to try and be a little more descriptive when possible. Um, so in this case, there was a live 911 call we heard for a suspect swinging a stick at cars in traffic. The drone located the individual uh, that was in a confrontation with public members, bystanders, but patrol was able to defuse the situation. So it didn't necessarily lead to an arrest. They were able to calm the situation, de-escalate, and um, I believe in this case was more of a mental health diversion than a, than a, a trip to um, uh, central processing. So this is a, a, a set, every call we fly uh, gets published um, for everyone to see in the public. So that is um, what's happening from the transparency standpoint. To go back to our slideshow, um, for those we have, um, there's there's a, multiple different ways this project is is overseen. There's policy. We have function code uh, on on UAS. We have what's called operational orders in house, which is essentially. Um, the commander's orders, like in my case, I write orders on some internal procedural things. And then we're governed by the FAA and the TSA um, with how these things need to operate. And why the TSA is because we're operating in the national airspace around Washington, D.C., which is very heavily restricted. So we do not use the drone. You can see here the restrictions. Uh, we do not use it to uh, identify people participating in lawful First Amendment protected activities. So you will not see the drone as first responder or any of our drones uh, used in any lawful First Amendment activity. If someone starts uh, assaulting somebody or breaking something and there's a crime, uh, we may uh, deploy a drone very limited to, to that particular event, uh, but not for the purposes of, of the overall um, First Amendment activity. We do not use any of our UAS, including DFR, uh, for facial recognition. We don't collect audio or voice recordings in any way um, as well. So um, I'm going to X out of this. I'm actually going to stop sharing. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of the, just a brief overview. I'll tell you where we're at now and where we're going. So um, you've seen on our dashboard, we've responded to over 600 uh, 911 or police generated uh, um emergencies in Silver Spring and Wheaton. So we're currently, uh, we started in Silver Spring in November and we started in Wheaton on February 1st with uh, those areas. Um, we we have seen a lot of success uh, preliminarily with, like I stated, with the goals of the program mirroring up to what we hypothesized the technology could do. And where we're looking to go now is the county executive um, We've done a lot of community engagement. And one thing that um, came out of our up county, our Gaithersburg, Germantown area, was a lot of community members were saying, hey, we want this technology in our community. They were contacting the council members. Um, three of our up county council members drafted a letter to the county executive explaining what their communities have been saying to them and requesting this service in the up county. Uh, we have identified the Gaithersburg, Germantown area as an area um, that would benefit from this, in our opinion. Um, and so the county executive included uh, Gaithersburg, a Gaithersburg site in his proposed budget. Uh, also, our community in Bethesda, uh, downtown Bethesda, Friendship Heights, uh, as you've seen probably in the news, there's been a lot of um, retail thefts, a lot of, there's been an increase in robberies, assaults, and other crimes uh, in the downtown Bethesda and our business area and, and down the Wisconsin Avenue corridor. Um, the Chamber of Commerce um, and various communities down there um, along the Wisconsin and the Connecticut Avenue corridor have written letters to the council um, and, and have expressed their desire to have the technology in their community as well. Uh, so the county executive also included uh, Bethesda uh, into his budget as well. Um, and I believe those deliberations are ongoing at the county council. If uh, those two sites are included in the next year's budget, which starts in July, we would start Gaithersburg uh, first. Um, we would start that um, up in the Gaithersburg area. We would be able to cover Montgomery Village, um, downtown Gaithersburg, the city of Gaithersburg, the Rio, 
uh, and things of that nature. And then parts of Germantown, like downtown Germantown, um, Great Seneca Highway, Fox Chapel, Milestone. So some of those areas up in Germantown, the airspace is less restrictive up there. So we can cover a larger area with the technology. So we'll be able to service a lot of those areas. And then obviously Bethesda would be limited to the same uh, operational area as Wheaton and Silver Spring, which is 1.2 miles around the launch site. And that's because of the FAA and the restricted airspace that we operate in there. So, and that would be primarily in the Bethesda Central Business District and Wisconsin Avenue and Connecticut Avenue corridors. So we would, uh, if approved, we would stand up Gaithersburg, we would stand up Bethesda. Um, to my knowledge, I haven't been told otherwise that I believe um, we're still would be continuing this in a pilot fashion, pilot project fashion. So it would still be under evaluation. We'd still be reporting out on a regular basis to not only the council, but the community. Uh, we would still be hosting and interacting with our community. We're doing a lot of community events. I'm actually presenting to a number of groups in the coming months uh, that have booked us up for, for presentations. If we expand to Gaithersburg and Bethesda, we will be looking to hold the same um, uh, town hall style meetings that we did in Silver Spring and Wheaton. That would be open to anybody from the community. We'll do a, a presentation uh, link. We'll stay like we did in Wheaton and Silver Spring. We'll answer questions until people have no more questions. And uh, we'll do that same engagement that we did in Wheaton and Silver Spring, but in those other areas um, if it gets approved. So. That's kind of where we are with it. Um, we have a program manager. It's a Lieutenant Doug Miller. He provides oversight of the program. We have the ability to audit flights and we have gone in and randomly spot checked various flights to ensure that they're in compliance with our policy and what we've told the community we would be doing with regards to camera angles and things of that nature. So we do have an ongoing uh, inspections that take place. Um, we have a lot of training that goes on um, this month already. We've we've done uh, 40 hours of training in the months only half over that we've been training our different members on different aspects of of uh, the technology and policies and procedures and things like that. So um, it's being done very thoughtfully. It's being done with a lot of emphasis on training and making sure we're staying on top of people and making sure we're getting it right. So um, happy to answer any questions or hopefully that covered kind of what you were looking for. I have a question. My my apologies. I was on mute. Thank you, Captain Coquino. Did I pronounce your name correct? Uh, Coquinos. Yep. I think you were Coquinos, right. Thank you. Um, so we have questions. Uh, I heard um, a voice. Who was that? that? That was me. Okay. Mr. Stevenson. Then uh, Ms. Branson. Uh, uh, or Ms. Quitman, which one of you were next? Probably Ms. Quitman. Oh. I was a little slow on the draw. All right, so we have one, two, three. Mr. Stevenson. Yes, um, um, you mentioned the uh, data. First of all, thank you so very much for being here and presenting. It was great um, and very informative. Um, my question is, in the uh, Gatesburg has an, an air park, and I'm curious to know, would there have to be communication with that air park if there is something in that specific area over on 124 before that drone can be released? Um, because there are low flying planes in that particular area. So would that be something within the approval from the county council, uh, city of Gatesburg, or would you all have to uh, would it go FAA? Yeah, so that's an FAA thing. So um, in any of our sites, we, we monitor the airspace. We utilize, um, um, a couple different technologies, but one of them is ADSB, which basically we can see on a radar, the planes, the helicopters, things in the air, what their altitude is, different things like that. So we're, we currently do that now. So when we operate in Gaithersburg, we have to be very careful around the air park for the reasons you mentioned. So there are a couple of additional restrictions. So we have to monitor what's called a, a CTAF radio. So we will have direct radio communication with air traffic control, and we could talk to um, aircraft if needed. The FAA mandates that UAS give way to any manned aircraft. So we cannot interfere with the, 
with the flight of a of an airplane or a helicopter or anything like that. So our our posture in the air park is going to be uh, very careful and very limited. If it's a busy air traffic day up there, that may impact our ability to respond to something in that area. We need to make sure we do it very safely and in accordance with uh, FAA law. If it's a time where air traffic's really light and we can monitor that and, and work in conjunction with the tower if we needed to, we may be able to respond. Um, that is one area of Gaithersburg, the air park, that um, depending where the emergency call is, we may reserve that area for the more serious, the most serious of type of events and try to avoid uh, lesser routine type events because of how busy the air traffic is over there. So that is a consideration. All right, thank you, uh, Ms. Branson. Excuse me, Ms. Quitman. Hi, thank you so much for this presentation. It was extremely informative and I appreciate it a lot. Um, I have sort of a two-part question. Um, my first part is, I know you mentioned facial recognition a little bit. Uh, the first part of the question is, do the drones currently have that capability slash are they planning to roll out that capability? Uh, no. So facial uh, recognition is a program. It's a standalone uh, software that images and video can be uploaded in. Um, none of the drones can uh, interface with that software technology. It's prohibited in our policy. So um, any images or video that's recorded on the drone uh, comes off the drone and it goes directly into our evidence.com uh, vault, just like police body camera and police like dash cam camera. So we can't take that file on our own and then go run that into a, another third party software. So we, we don't, it doesn't interface, it doesn't stream to it. Uh, we have no plans of going that route. That's something our community has felt very strongly that we don't do. And we've heard the community on that. Um, this is a very transparent program that we've enjoyed the community involvement. And so much so that we found that topic to be so important that we put that in our policy in bold. So, uh, so, so you're saying that there is no possibility of footage from the drones being used in conjunction with facial recognition software? Uh, could it be done in the country? I'm sure it could. We're not doing it. Um, okay. You know, I will say this. If we had an instance, let's say we had... Um, a terrorist activity and somebody's was caught on the drone camera. I think that if the community and our local leaders and other people wanted to see if we could use that, that would have to be a very big decision, but the police department's prohibited from doing it. But if the community drove a change for some reason, that's the community's choice, but we're not doing it. Okay. Um, I'm just taking some quick notes here. Yeah. Um, so then I guess sort of jumping off of that, although the drones do not currently or plan to have facial recognition capability, um, I noticed that you mentioned that um, the this data will not be used against people participating in lawful First Amendment protected activities. And something I'd like to ask is, how would you respond in the case of someone making a 911 call to report either minor or non-existent illegal activity like vandalism or you know just pushing and shoving and crowding at protests or other First Amendment events, especially in light of the recent police brutality that has been happening at student protests of sort of how do you how do you ensure that the drones will not be used to criminalize Montgomery County students in that way? So I over, I also oversee our, um, what we call our public order response team. So basically the teams that go out and they're especially trained in community dialogue and first amendment activities and things of that nature. So we've had drones for over three years now and 
and post George Floyd, we had a drone program and we've never used a drone uh, um, as part of our public order response. So we, when we do our plans now, even we were just at a, pub, a first amendment event yesterday, a drone is not even on the roster, if that makes sense. So we, we, that's not what we do. Um, generally, if we were going to incorporate a drone and, and I, I would see a drone being incorporated into violent actions against people. And that would be something that would be observed by officers uh, in the area. We, we station officers at the First Amendment gatherings to just ensure that both sides can lawfully and freely express themselves. And there we're just a neutral person to facilitate that. If a fire broke out, if someone started throwing Molotov cocktails, if someone started assaulting somebody and it rose to a significant level, if a drone was ever introduced into that, that it would be directed to specifically uh, go to the area where we believe that crime was taking place and provide video information that can help direct officers or fire off, you know, department members and stuff to deal with that. Once that situation is resolved, the drone leaves. It doesn't need to linger around and monitor people who are not breaking the law. So um, it says in our policy, we don't use drones to monitor First Amendment activity. As long as I've been in special operations and even before that, we have not introduced drones even into our toolbox when going to these events. We don't plan to unless we there's some information of some significant violent intentions. And then even then, we wouldn't send a drone unless we've already confirmed something's happening with some officers that are stationed there. Okay, thank you. I appreciate those answers. Yep. Ms. Branson. Hi. Um, so, um, like, uh, like Eva, I have sort of have like a multi-part question based on uh, scenarios. Um, um, I'm glad to understand that you are expanding to Bethesda because I thought I had read that you weren't going to expand to Bethesda. Um, I also thought I read that um, there will be a, a decrease in um, 911 operators. Um, so uh, so my, my question kind of starts there. Um, what effect, if any, Will a decrease in 911 operators have on the effectiveness of your drone program? That's number one. Number two, um, it's uh, um, you mentioned that um, that the video from the drones is available for public consumption, if you will. So, so I'm wondering how, if at all. Um, the video from the drones can be linked um, to uh, police body worn cameras or um, dashboard cameras if such a, um, a um, if such um, if something occurs that 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 information uh, would be useful. You know, could could a a private party request um, that kind of of information. Um, um, that's two, three. Um, you said that in Silver Spring and Wheaton, I believe you said that there were, the drones had responded to about 600 calls, which sounds like a lot, but what's the universe? I mean, how, how many calls were there during that period? So, you know, like what's the percentage of calls that the drone responded to? And then finally, um, you mentioned a program manager. So I seem to think in the back of my head, um, when this program, when the drone is first responder program first began, um, that it was a contractor who was um, involved. I don't remember if it's in like flying the drones or doing something with the drones. So. Could, could you explain whether there is any um, contractor or private sector sort of involvement with the, um, with the actual operation of the drones? So those are my questions. Thank you. No, no problem. Um, I'll, uh, I'll kind of go in reverse 
Um, I wrote it. I wrote, I took some notes so I don't forget anything that you asked, but so we have a program manager that's a police executive that oversees all of the drones at the police department. So DFR plus our existing program that's been up for a couple of years now. Um, so that person is a, a police department employee that's not affiliated. If there was DFR program or not, we would still have a police executive providing oversight to the drone program. And that is one of the deputy directors at special operations. Uh, that person also has a slew of other jobs underneath their umbrella, but drones is just one of them. Um, so the DFR program, it's a pilot. Um, so obviously we're, we're piloting it. We're going to um, see where this goes. We're going to keep reporting back to the community and obviously the community and our local leaders and stuff at some point will make a determination on where we're going to go with this long term. Um, now, so in the short term, yes, we're using contractors for the top of the roof. So we have uh, police officers in our operations center because they're viewing the video, they're communicating to other police officers, they're actually making law enforcement decisions a lot of times, uh, you know, whether it's Fourth Amendment decisions or policy type calls like, hey, you know, an officer go here or don't go here, or you don't need to do this, or we can, we can handle this for you and help you out. So type of stuff like that. But the contractor is the person at each site, um, and this is due to FAA regulations, we have to have a person on top of the roof at each drone uh, position site. And so right now that person is a contractor. Uh, so right now we have two locations. So there's two contractors. And what they do is they work the, the time that we're operational, which we're not operational 24 hours a day. Um, you know, we're operational. Uh, the FY24 supplement uh, has us 40 hours a week per site. Um, and what that person does is they make sure the drone is safe. They do a safety inspection um, in conjunction with our folks. Um, everything's double and triple verif verified amongst themselves, and then we verify. Um, they make sure the drone is always operationally ready. Um, they uh, make sure that the drone's safe to launch and land, so they help with that. And then when the drone's flying, they're observing the sky uh, in conjunction with us using some other technologies to make sure that the airspace is safe and that if there is something that's flying, because not every aircraft in DC has a transmitter. Some of the military helicopters and such, you won't see them on the radar. So our rooftop person can say, hey, you have a helicopter about 800 feet. It's about two miles to the east. And then we'll make appropriate adjustments as needed. So it's a team between the roof and the operations room, but the roof is the contractor for now. Um, I think depending on the direction of this program, if it continues past the pilot, it's my recommendation for somebody um, that has more knowledge than I do, probably OHR or OMB, to say, is it cheaper to have a contractor uh, for the tax for our taxpayers on that roof, or would it be cheaper to, cheaper to have a civilian uh, professional staff uh, employee on the roof? And I think that's a later discussion that you know we all as a county need to have. Um, so excuse me, I just I'm just trying to be clear on what the. So, you know, I, I don't I don't know this technology. So, um, you know, like who's operating the joystick? OK, who's actually flying the thing? That's 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 a you know, in, in what you said, I didn't get a clear picture of who's actually flying the thing. OK, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. OK, so the person on top of the roof roof has the drone controller, right? That's the, the controller with the joysticks. It's connected to. Uh, it used to be connected to an iPad, but it runs in an Android platform now. So it's just a controller with antennas. Uh, it looks like a giant Game Boy for those that remember like Nintendo Game Boy back in the day. Um, so they always have control of the aircraft. So they, they can, if there was a safety issue, they can take control. What the technology allows is while the drone is launched, the person with the controller can click a button that allows remote shared operation. So what that means is that the officers that are in the operations room, they actually do it off of a PlayStation 5 controller, which is kind of funny, but they can manipulate the drone and the camera and move it to best adjust to where the emergency is to be able to see what's going on. And so that's happening through a computer program that's, that's 
through the internet back to the controller, the person on the roof has the ultimate authority, but they're allowing that shared um, ability to manipulate the drone through the controller. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It was just, uh, that was just confusing to me. I didn't know if the person on the roof was making law enforcement decisions. Nope, just the, um, just the MCPD officers that are in the operations room. So, um, okay. So your some of the other questions, um, the overall calls compared to the overall calls in the entire area. So uh, we have not run, and it's actually never been asked. So if potentially this body is asking for it, we could tally it. How many calls are in the operational area of the drone in comparison to what they're running? So we're only running the drone, like I said, a limited period of time. You know, you have 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're only doing it, you know, um, uh, we're budgeted for for the 40 hours uh, a week. Um, and and obviously in fiscal year 25, I forgot to mention, the, the county executive's proposal is to run five days a week in Silver Spring and Wheaton, 12 hours a day. And... 40 hours a week in Gaithersburg and Bethesda. So um, the operations are not 24 hours a day. So it's going to be hard to do that, you know, apples and apples comparison of what are we running compared to calls. We can pull calls from the same time frame and see. There's a lot of calls we don't run. So purposefully, we don't run calls that occurred earlier where the suspect's not on scene. We don't run parking complaints. We don't run noise complaints. And that came from, um, you know, remember last Labor Day, NYPD was flying drones around people's backyards for backyard parties. And that was a question we got. And our community was like, hey, we don't want that to happen here. And we said, okay, well, we're not going to fly those type of calls. So we don't fly animal calls. So there's a lot of calls we don't fly. So you have to kind of, there's a lot of probably math to work in there, but it can be done. Um, we, we try to tend to favor... Um, in progress calls where suspects are on scene or calls where we think people might need help, medical help, or we're not running medical calls, but if, if it's a police call where someone, it's a joint response, we, we've had calls where we've been able to locate someone that they've had trouble finding that needed an ambulance. Um, there's also times where we're not flying because of weather, right? There's wind restrictions, uh, heavy rains, um, Believe it or not, we had just had some limited interference with this solar thing that just happened this week, right? The solar storm um, that you may have heard about. So there's times where we're not operational as well. So that would impact the overall data analysis there. So, but I will tell you that from a mindset perspective, when we are operational, our goal is to fly as many calls as we can uh, in that time period. And sometimes we are up flying a particular call and there may be two or three other calls that come out that we can't respond to because we're already working another incident. So those things come up too. So um, gauging that might be a little difficult, but uh, but just the mindset is to try to fly as much as we can. And everybody in the in the room is, is excited about the program and wants to work hard. So we're seeing a lot of energy um, to try to do that. The... Other, I don't know if we may have lost uh, Miss. I know you're still there. No, I'm here. Uh, um, so yeah, then I asked you about the potential. First of all, yes, I think it would be helpful for us to have an idea of what the universe is during the relevant time periods, because you know you said I think you said 600 some odd calls, which sounds a lot, but you know I don't know maybe you got 7,000 calls, or, and then it then it doesn't sound like very many. So. If, if the idea is to use this as a force multiplier, then, then I think it's helpful to understand the, the, the universe, if you will, right? At least the relevant universe, which seems to be, you know, which I understand there are a lot of factors and variables and stuff like that. But, but I just think it would be, you know, more helpful to understand how this is being used in a force multiplier way. And I don't think you can do that with just like raw numbers. I think percentages are helpful. Yeah, you know, and, and, so, and so we also capture that efficiency piece a different way. I look at how many calls can we handle without the need for officers to continue. So in those 74 calls on the dashboard, there's more that we've canceled in route 
we freed up like over 140 officers since November to be able to go to other tasks. So we're, we're focusing our efficiency goal on the number of officers that we either disregard or prevent having to be sent to calls, which allows them to go to other things. I do see what you're talking about with the other data point, which is another way to look at it as well. But we are looking at it from how many officers and how many calls are we able to handle without officers having to go, which is just one part of the analysis. Um, we average now, it's getting busier as the weather lifts. We've been averaging between seven and 10 um, flights per shift, which um, you, know, you have a flight, it lands, there's a little bit of administrative time, um, but we're averaging almost, um, you know, a flight every 45 minutes or so. So, and then we're up on a call for about, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. So it's, it's fairly active throughout the whole night. Um, you know, in order to do more, you can only do, we can only do one drone at a time in, in the area because of our FAA regulations. So when you look at how much of a force multiplier is it, you know, you could have run 30 calls tonight, but you only ran 10. Well, we are a little limited with the regulations and the technology too, as well. So, um, but yeah. Um, Captain, your other Captain, question about the video. So, Captain, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, can I have your attention? <clears throat> In the interest of time, can we ask that everyone that has additional questions, email them uh, to the department? Because we have a number of additional items that we have to discuss on the agenda. Uh, Captain, thank you so much. This was absolutely fascinating. I will be uh, emailing two questions <laughs> that okay, I didn't perfect. get a chance to get in. Um, but thank you uh, once again for your time. And again, um, anyone who has questions, we will forward them uh, to to the captain so that we can um, learn what we need to know. All right. And uh, and one last thing, I will. The three remaining points that um, Miss uh, Branson had, I can uh, furnish an email with. I'll incorporate that with the email with the other questions that you that you had. I want to make sure she gets answers for those other things as well. So thank you for your time. Thanks for having me. Perfect. Just uh, uh, Susan, should we can we email those questions to to you or to Logan so that they can all be put on one sheet to send? Yes, okay. either one of us. Is great. All right. Very good. So everyone, please email any questions that we have for Captain Coquinos about the DFR. Please email them. Uh, this evening while they're still hot and so so that you don't forget them to Susan or to uh, L Logan so that we can uh, forward them. Just real quick in the chat, um, Ms. Walsh did post a question about, you know, how much each drone would cost, which Susan posted some budgetary information, which I think addresses the question for those of you who are interested and you have not been in the chat. Thank you again, Captain, uh, uh, for your work and for the information tonight. All right, thank you. And anytime uh, you have anything, feel free to ask through Susan and we'll get you all some answers. All right, thanks again. All right, we're a bit behind our agenda schedule, but we're gonna move forward. At this time, we wanna hear from the sub uh, work plan subcommittee. Sure, hopefully, uh, first I wanna thank my fellow subcommittee members. Hopefully everybody got a copy of our final work product. Um, I don't know if you have any specific questions. If so, I think the, the plan was or if not, either way, the plan was to see if anybody had any specific questions about it before we more or less formally adopt it, approve it, um, at least at, at the point we're at now from moving forward for at least the, the uh, foreseeable future. Yeah, I don't have any questions, but I do have some concerns. Um, so, um, uh, is it possible to put it up on the screen? Susan, do you have that? I do, but you're going to have to give me about 30 seconds to do that. So, okay. No, we don't. I just put it up. Oh, look at you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. It's because my, my, my concerns are linked to exact language. And so I want everybody to be able to know what I'm talking about. Um, so under goals, okay, sorry, um, is that goal? I think goal is the first thing, right? It's right here. Can you, am I, is this what you want? Goal. Yeah, but you know, I can't see a thing on this phone. Um, there, there is language that says, um, 
and um, there is language that talks about accountability to the public. And I'm sorry, I can't be more precise. I just wrote down. Okay, so so Ms. Branson, it says goal to offer guidance and propose recommendations to the county council concerning policing, including policing policies, programs, legislations, or regulations pertinent to the Montgomery County Police Department's ongoing policing efforts aimed at cultivating cooperative alliances and community engagement initiatives, fostering trust, transparency, and accountability, all while aligning with the expectations of public safety stakeholders. Right. So I think it should say and accountability to the public, period, because the all, all that aligning stuff and the stakeholder stuff, I, I, I don't you know, I'm I'm not comfortable with that. I, I don't think our, our goal should be to align. I think our goal should be to to be accountable to the public. Um, so so that that to me is troubling um, under. Okay, wait. Um, can, can can we can we discuss each one? Are there any any thoughts there on Ms. Branson's uh, opinion that it should be changed to accountability to the public? Does anyone agree or disagree? Can you raise your hand if you would like to add to the conversation, uh, Ms. Quitman? I was on this subcommittee and I agree with Ms. Branson. All right. It would help if if you are able because I'm sharing. If you could use the um electronic hand raise, then then you would uh, come to the top. So you agree. Does anyone disagree? I'm having some issues with my screen. Um, OK, I, I don't want to say I necessarily disagree. I just. Maybe I'm thinking of a different mindset and maybe someone can clarify this for me. Now, I do believe that this committee does have accountability to the public, but I thought our first accountability is to the city council, who in turn has the overall accountability to the public, correct? I, I mean, I think it's accurate to say we were appointed by the county council. And, and so, you know, if we're answering anybody, it is to them. Well, let, let me let me let me further clarify while I'm why I'm asking for clarification in that regard because there's a accountability board for the county as well as the state as far as police misconduct, and I don't believe that's our role as a committee to be focusing on accountability of officers misconduct or otherwise. So I, I just want to make sure that I have that the proper understanding. I don't I think if you read the sentence in in if you read the sentence in context, I don't think it references that kind of accountability at all. It talks about transparency and accountability, you know. And um, my only thing is that it should say and accountability to the public. Period. It shouldn't talk about aligning with stakeholders and and law enforcement. I don't think we're here to align. I, I think we're. I, I think that's. Um, if we end up aligning, that's great. But but I don't think we should have that as our goal. I, I think our goal, you know, should be um, to um, to the to um, the, the 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 public, um, and and that that shifts. Um, um, you know, saying that we're aligning with law enforcement really shifts the fundamental nature of of what the um of of what this um commission was um designed to do. I don't think that language is anywhere in the legislation about aligning with law enforcement. Um, I was also in the committee. I. Uh... I have no problem at all with uh, Ms. Branson's uh, suggestion. I, uh, it, accountability uh, is it's uh, it's not just uh, for um, in this context. It's not just for uh, misdeeds that may have happened, uh, but it's it's also for performance. Um, is 
No, is is the police department uh, meeting the expectations of the community in terms of uh, um, curtailing, preventing crime, and protecting uh, our citizens? Correct. I, I mean, I don't I don't disagree with any of those points. I just think over the past few meetings, I, I guess the underlying tone that I'm hearing is more of us fixing the police department directly versus the role of research, making recommendations, and hoping to assist with policy. Like, yeah, and, and you raise a good point. And if I may suggest, and this is a little bit off topic, but uh, there was a suggestion that we reach out to the PAV, the Police Accountability. Um, board and um and and reach out to them so we can communicate and and make sure that we're not working across purposes or duplicating and so that addresses your point i think and i correct I, correct correct maybe we can make that uh, part of a a future discussion maybe in next next uh, meeting uh we, we we can we can do that but let's let's continue to work on this draft um, I want to say I don't think that <clears throat> leaving it at accountability to the public in general um, negates any of the things that you shared, Mr. Watson. I think it's it's general enough that <clears throat> it makes the goal achievable, even to to things that may come up that we hadn't even thought of, right? Um, and so, uh, would you all like to leave this open ended, or should we take a vote on a language change? for the goal i would suggest voting on a language change but i'm not sure if mr donahue has something he wants to share i just thought what if we said accountability to its stakeholders period get rid of the aligning because i think the the stakeholders are more than just the community so if we want accountability to its stakeholders it would, it would encompass everybody who has a stake in the outcome of of the, the police department's efforts to do so. And that's different from wow. the public? Yes, it inc yeah. it's inclusive of the public. Okay. Other and, and see, that, that's my problem is that to me, the stakeholders, you know, we, the, and, and I, I have that as, as a question uh, because that language is throughout. I don't know who, we are identifying as our stakeholders. You know, it's, to me, it's not our uh, stakeholders. It's, it's not our stakeholders. It's the police department. Well, no. Um, yeah. If this is our, if this is our work plan, then we are defining who we. It, it's up to us to define what the language means, mm -hmm. and and so the stakeholders reference can be just. The law enforcement community, for for some people, that's that might be the way they're reading it, and and I don't think that I I think that undermines um, the legislative intent, and so I think if we and everywhere it says stakeholders, I think we should just say the public, um, because that's really, you know, I don't I don't you know the uh, the folks who worry about. The, the law enforcement community and the, them as stakeholders standing along standing alone excuse me are, th that's the public that's the public service committee at a county council that's not us so um so I, I think the the stakeholder language troubles me because it's not defined and I think it's a lot safer just to say the public because the public does include everybody it includes a law enforcement community it includes you know, residents, it, it includes, it includes everybody. But the language talks about the police department's efforts, not our efforts. So it's the police department's working to foster transparency, accountability with its stakeholders, which includes us, by the way, as the ACP, it includes the PAB, it includes the county council. So I think, I think it's a more inclusive, which is what I think we would want to promote. It's not just the the police department help being accountable to the public, they need to be held accountable to everybody that has a stake in its outcome. And that's the way that language that at least I see it 
um, it's being written. So I think to, if you have an issue with the aligning with, with that stuff, I think we can accomplish the same thing if we just say accountability with its stakeholders, period. And that it, I think that satisfies our objective, our mandate, as well as what we want the police department to be doing. That's just the way, I mean, that's mentally how I think we, we work through it as a subcommittee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand that. And and what I'm saying to you is that to me, the language, the, the stakeholder language really is limiting. And to say the public instead is far more inclusive. We, I, we are I, not. I think we, the, I, I think the public is the restriction, the stakeholder, it opens it up more globally. I see it the opposite way, actually. Okay, wait a no, minute. We're, we're, wait a minute. No. We're, we're in a bit of a tennis match here. Does anybody else want to chime in? Uh, Ms. Quitman, Mr. Stevenson. Uh, th oh, I'm sorry. They Mr. Have Mr. Mr. Watson, you're number three, Ms. Quitman. Mr. Stevenson had his hand up first. You should go. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Stevenson. Thank, thank you, Eva. Um, um, could we take a happy medium here and um, give a definition? It sounds like we're just going back and forth on a definition of what stakeholders is. Is it possible that we can put a um, a notation and say stakeholders uh, meaning and give our definition of what we mean by stakeholders? It sounds like we're almost saying the same thing. It sounds like exactly. Mr. Donahue is including the county council, the public, and everybody else. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, Ms. Branson, you you know you think that the people who read stakeholders might have a misinterpretation of what that is. Um, when I saw stakeholders and I first read it, I thought specific individuals in the public when I first read it. So I think the definition, um, if it's not defined, someone could walk away with their own definition and misinterpret what we're trying to say. All right. And and I agree with that. We don't want someone. We don't want the document to read where people can come up with their own interpretation of what we're trying to do. Uh, Ms. Uh, Quitman and Mr. Watson. We could also just eliminate this concern by eliminating the um, accountability to the public, to the stakeholders, whatever. We could just say fostering trust, transparency, and accountability, or fostering trust, transparency. Yeah. and service to the public, which everyone can agree is a good thing and puts the interest of public service first, which is what we're trying to do here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Watson? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, again, I think everyone's making valid points. I, I just think that there might be some overthought here. Um, just by its very definition, a stakeholder is a person with an interest or concern in something, most times related to business. Um, but again, anyone who has an interest or concern, and I would think based on our work here, there's a number of different parties that has an interest or concern in what we do, be it police, the city council, the overall public. So again, I just I just think we're playing a game of semantics. We're splitting hairs and kind of overthinking it. So I, I think Ms. Quitman's uh, last suggestion might solve that problem. Um, but again, I, I, I guess my fear is that we're gonna be in a second meeting and for the sake of time, we're going to lose very valuable time that could be otherwise spent focusing on semantics. Right. All right. So, uh, Ms. Quitman, do you want to put in um, into a motion your language change? Will you state it again, please, for the record? Yes. I would like to move to change that sentence in the work plan from account aligning with the expectations of public safety stakeholders to fostering trust, transparency, accountability, comma, and public service, period. Is there a second? Yeah, I second it. All right, are you ready for the question? 
All in favor, say could, aye. Could you please read reread it? Sorry. Can you restate it, please? Yes. The change of phrasing I suggest is to change that sentence to. Thank you for screen sharing this again. Fostering trust, transparency, accountability, and public service. Period. Yes. Thank you, Logan. All right. Um. And we have a second, correct? Do we have the second recorded? Yeah, I second it. Okay. Um, all in favor of the change, say aye or raise your hands. Aye. All right. Does anyone oppose? Aye. All right. Motion carried. Um, any other considerations? So as is is the stakeholder language, do we want to consider revising that in all places? Because if that is if that is what it is, can we push that back to the committee um, to make some revisions? And then um, we can work on connecting with the Police Accountability Board to make sure there's not significant overlap and 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 what they do or their work plan in ours between now and the next meeting. So um, is everyone okay with that if we push this back? Uh, uh, Mr. Gonzalez? You're still muted. My apologies. Yeah, I, I, I think what, what I'd like to propose is that uh, we designate um, uh, a member or a subcommittee to reach out to the PAB so that we, um, we can resolve this issue and any others that um, may come up. Hmm, a subcommittee? Rather than just making it, uh, uh, I mean, the the subcommittee that's working on on the uh, on the work plan um, would have to reach out to um, the PAV, but uh, for this particular purpose. But I, it seems to me that we might want to establish a more uh, uh, permanent or a um, a more systemic uh, way of. Um, consulting with the PAB sure. uh, so that we do not work at cross purposes or duplicate uh, work. Right. That makes sense. Uh, so are you recommending that the, the same committee that's been working on the plan that they reach out to the PAB? Uh, not or not a new some, committee? I, I would like someone, either someone or a subcommittee to, to do that. Um, and it's up to, you know, to... Okay us to decide who that person or those persons should be. Sure. Now, let me just say for this task, it should be as simple as getting a copy of their document, right? Don't they, shouldn't, shouldn't they have a similar document that we could compare and contrast, although we can still meet with them for collaboration, but that, that's a longstanding group. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm, I'm friends with the chair. He's a ministry colleague, Mr. Walker. Um, and so perhaps we can get the document, but if, if the committee the commission feels a committee is necessary, we can have a committee. Um, Ms. Branson. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, I, I don't, I mean, I, I can understand the concern, but you know, we are, it's kind of a rabbit hole. So, 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 suppose they disagree. I mean, suppose they say we don't think y'all ought to be doing X, Y, Z. You know, as as the kids say, they're not the boss of us. So, so I don't, you know, I don't see the the utility in it. Um, and and I think it just could really um set our work back. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that I don't, you know, we don't. Um, it it might be helpful. To, uh, I know in the last iteration of this committee, we did have um, uh, Bishop Walker um, as a guest, and and you know we spoke with him about you know um, areas of um, common concern, um, and it may be helpful if that's readily available to have the meetings from that that meeting distributed so that people can see, cause I don't think a whole lot's changed. Um, so before we, you know, be, before we embark upon, you know, creating another subcommittee, 
it, it might be great to just have you know the the meetings from that minute center uh the yeah the minutes from that meeting sent around so that people can actually see for themselves that that's number one the other thing um are, are we moving on to the to the to other concerns because I do have I, I do have uh three more concerns about this work plan so so what I'm thinking is in the interest of time, if we're going to send this back to the subcommittee, maybe you can send it to them um, in, in writing and, and they can come back in June with another document or with an updated uh, document. I would also like to welcome. Oh. That, that would be fine with me. If, uh, so we're going to I mean, I can. It, I, first of all, I don't know if anybody else has has other concerns, um, but um, but yeah, I have I have three more things that I think need to come out. So let's just let's just see. Uh, are there other concerns with the work plan uh, from any other uh, member of the commission? All right. So, so Ms. Branson, if, if you can send those, I'm, I'm coming to you, Mr. Gonzalez. Susan, I have a question. Do you know if the PAB has a write-up of, of their work plan or their, dis, or descriptor of, of what they do? They have a lot of um, information on their website, including an annual report, which states their, their um, work goals for the year. And I can circulate both the uh, website and the different documents to you. Okay, so that might that might be good to go back to the the subcommittee. Who was on this committee? Uh, Mr. Donahue, Ms. Quitman, so um, and Mr. Gonzalez, uh, uh, and 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 you next, Mr. Gonzalez. Would you all be open to taking a, a review of that along with Ms. Branson's questions and coming back next? Absolutely, week? yes, sir. Thank you so much, Mr. Gonzalez. I'm sorry you've been so patient. Not at all. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, yeah, I I just. Um, wanted to I had a, a couple of suggestions based on the on the letter that we received uh, from the county council um giving us with us their priorities and I, we can we can I can co convey those to the committee as well and can, we can work it out then all right that'll be perfect because we have 12 minutes and we have one more agenda item to discuss and that is discussion of bill 2-24 the freedom to leave act and we need to discuss it because uh, a councilman, uh, Jawando, uh, will be with us on the ninth, or is it our next meeting? Our next meeting is not the ninth, is it? Is it the that's the second Monday or the third Monday? I think it's the tenth, but I'll check. It's, it's the definitely tenth. the second Monday of June. Right. Okay. So we're opening the floor for discussion um, uh, and questions on the Freedom to Leave Act. In preparation for meeting with Councilman Juwando. Any questions at all? Know, do we know what Councilmember Juwando will be consulting with us on, or if he's just here to give us sort of a backgrounder on the bill and ask for our feedback or discussion of it? I had. I had asked for them to be able, I had asked their office if they could provide an overview. Um, you've received the testimony already and you have a copy of the bill, which I'm happy to circulate again. But I think mostly he'd be there to ask, um, to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, lovely, thank you. So, so since nobody has any questions tonight to that end, can I recommend that if people do have you know, uh, do have questions for Mr. Jawando on the tenth that they send them to Susan by the third or something. Um, you know, I don't know how. I mean, I don't, I don't have any questions about the bill, but, um, but you know, if if people have reviewed the bill and have questions about it, uh, if we want to proceed in an orderly fashion, it would be good for the chair to have possession of those questions. Right. Would we send them to him ahead of time so that he he will be prepared with the information? Absolutely. Would... Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a motion? Because I was going to second that. 
<laughs> yes, I, I move that we um, yeah. that we that anyone with questions about the bill mm -hmm. send them to um, Susan by June third, um, mm -hmm. so that she and um, Reverend Bellamy can review them and then forward them to Councilman Juwando. I second that motion. My apologies. All right, it's been moved and seconded that we collect questions to send uh, to Councilman Juwando concerning the Freedom to Leave Act by June 3rd. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, any opposition? Motion carried. All right, so that is the end um, of the agenda. It is not. Ms. Branson? Rev, uh, Reverend Bellamy, I think, I don't know, maybe I maybe I missed this part or maybe I just didn't get it. But um, I thought we had an issue the last time with um, a, um, a um, um, inquiry that came through on the um, on the email or something. Um, and I didn't know if I can't remember if we had voted on a, first of all, a general response to anyone who may, um, you know, who may email us. And secondly, whether, you know, we had determined how we would like to handle specific, uh, specific requests that may come in on the email. I, I wasn't sure if we had already done that. I, I know we talked about it, but I wasn't sure we had actually made decisions about it. Hmm. All right. And so uh, again, Ms. Branson, we need to discuss, is this with regards to, to the meetings act? Like we need to discuss if someone reaches us, reaches out to us by email, can you say it again, please? No, there, there was a, and and I think it was distributed in the, um, in the materials for today. There was someone who had emailed us about, um, about uh, our traffic data report and asking, hey, if you all. Uh, but what do you all think about uh, cameras on school buses? Mm -hmm. Right. And 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 that was raised mm, maybe the last meeting or the meeting before that, because it was apparently the first time we we received anything in that format. So so I thought we had agreed that if we should receive um, a, a an inquiry through that format, um, that the person would get an automated, automatically generated response. Mm -hmm. I, 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 that's number one. Okay. And and number two is the the person really did ask a very specific question. Um, so in in the event that folks ask specific questions in the future, um. I, I am requesting that probably not in the six minutes we have left, but but that we we do um, come up with a way um, we do make a decision about how we answer those questions because I don't want people to think they write us and then it just like disappears into the ether. Right. And so we need to come up with a generated response, you know. Thank you for your inquiry as a member. This is, I'm not in liberty to share certain. So um, would you be opening, open, excuse me, uh, Ms. Branson, to use some of your legalese as an attorney to give us an, um, maybe an example of what that would look like? Yeah, you don't have to be an attorney to do that. This is, uh, all we need to say is thank you for your letter to the commission. We we will take, we will consider your, we will consider your, your inquiry and respond. Period. End of story. That's all we need to say. And and then and then we need to do that. We, we need to figure out how we consider their inquiry and respond. But at all least right. people know, you know, hey, you you've been acknowledged. You you've been acknowledged. 
All right, Logan, we have that caught verbatim what she just said, right? So we can start with that. Is there anything that we would add to um, a response um, for uh, information that is sent to any of us, I guess, individually? Can you re can you restate that again, Ms. Branson? Do you? I know you you ripped it off the top, but yeah, I think all we need to say is thank you for your thank you for your um, message to the ACP. We will consider your the issues you raise and and respond. I mean, we can say within 14 days or whatever, whatever you want to, you know, maybe you want to leave it open, just we will respond. And then, you know, sincerely, you know, chair, um, chair, um, chair Bellamy, that's, that's it. I just, I just feel pretty strongly that when people write, they, they ought to know that, you know, they've gotten that, that, like I said, it just hasn't like disappeared into the ether. Right. Well, don't put my name in it if they're writing one of you individually. We could just say, <laughs> sincerely, ACP, you're going to have people waiting for me at the church parking lot. You didn't answer my question. So I kind of, <laughs> I kind of wrote, I wrote out what you said and I, I put at our earliest convenience, just, just to kind of note it. Is that that's good. I think that's it? good. Now, do we have to formalize that like with a vote that we're going to agree or can we all just agree that that is how we will respond to individual inquiries? Mr. Gonzalez? There are a couple of hands up. Oh, great. Oh, what order? Let's see. Participant. Ah. All right. Uh, Susan, Ms. Quitman. I'm going to lower my hand. I just wanted to let you know there's only been one actual individual who's written in and I have let him know that it's been forwarded to you. We didn't have enough time on today's agenda to add it for consideration. We can add that to next month's agenda. Um, and I also told him because he's the one person that I would let him know when it gets scheduled on the agenda. Um, but that if, if we get an overwhelming number of people writing in, that's gonna have to be changed to just something like giving the link to the agenda and they can keep an eye out. And um, if you do issue any kind of formal guidance or response, that will get posted on your website too. All right, thank you, Susan. Um, Ms. Quitman, then Ms. Daphnis. Yes, I would like to make a suggestion that may turn into a motion of how we deal with these citizen inquiries. My suggestion being that we create a subcommittee whose membership will be determined not today, uh, hopefully via response to an email that Susan sends out after this meeting over the next couple of weeks. Um, and that that subcommittee that subcommittee meets monthly when needed to discuss any citizen inquiries or complaints that have come in over the prior month. I, I like that. Uh, Christy. Um, I was just going to uh, suggest like maybe we don't need a subcommittee or maybe we just need some sort of tracker or something of outstanding actions or motions or something of the sort. Right. So Susan, are, are you keeping these as they come in now? Like if someone has a question, question for the ACP, um, where do those questions go? From the ACP or to the ACP? To the ACP. Yes, I've got. I have circulated that twice to you, but I keep right. them. I have a. I have a folder for all ACP correspondence. All right. So maybe it's just you, maybe it's just an agenda item of like what are the outstanding actions or something. Yeah. Okay. So that's a good idea. <laughs> I just wanted to point to Eva's comment in the chat about being respectful of pronouns as we're addressing one another. Very good. So let me say, I will use everyone's first name uh, moving forward. I was raised by Southerners, and so I'm used to uh, saying, you know, uh, giving a handle and using last names. But I uh, please forgive me if I misgendered anyone. I want to give everyone due respect, okay? So I will go by first names. If if first names doesn't offend anyone, in my family, it would offend everyone. How dare you, right? <laughs> but um, thank you, Christy. And thank you, Eva. 
All right. Um, is, is there any other business we need to discuss? I just had a few things and, and not to dump more work on Susan, because these might be just inquiries to go back to the police department with. Um, one of the things that we were due this evening was a response from our uh, request last month as far as their, the police department's implementation plan that lists their priorities and the implementation dates of the um, audit findings and the reimagining dashboard um, recommendations. I know that, as we said before, the dashboard is kind of confusing and very complicated and very hard to understand. So we really, at least I couldn't from that, determine what is the police department currently working on now in terms of those uh, recommendations and what are the priorities um, and when when does the police department expect for those uh, priorities to be implemented? So if they have such a thing, I think it would be good for them to, uh, even if, if someone can present that or provide a copy to us at some future time, I think that would be good um, for all of us to see. Um, the second thing I'd like to request from them is a copy of their uh, Commission on Accreditation from Law Enforcement Agency Assessors Report. Um, this is the every four year audit, external audit by CALEA for the department to maintain its accreditation status um, as a CALEA accredited law enforcement agency. I believe that audit was done in February um, and they should have already received a copy of their final report. Even if it's redacted, if there's information as far as specific contact information about the assessors or whatever they would have a concern about releasing. Um, but I think these things I think are critical documents for us to see as a commission because if we're looking at ways to make recommendations and improve operations, um, outreach, community uh, policing efforts, I mean, these are things that um, all of these audit findings and, and things that people have said are um, issues the department should consider doing, we obviously, I think, should be seeing those. Um, so we know how to proceed and what their priorities are versus what ours would be. I also want to find out if I believe we may have sent a letter to the county executive about the um, police chief hiring process where we may have had uh, have an opportunity to ask questions. I don't know if we ever got a response to that, but I also know there was a meeting last week that I believe maybe Reverend Bellamy may have been invited to or attended uh, to meet the nom new nominee. Um, so I'm just wondering where and when would we have an opportunity to ask specific questions since it sounds like the decision's already been made by the executive of who he wants to put forward to the county council. And the last thing I would like to see from the department, uh, it's actually part of our work plan, uh, it's the Maryland Police Accountabil Accountability Act compliance. So there was uh, actually going back to what Francisco said, there was a comment in the uh, uh, council president's letter back to us for their priorities. There was a statement in there about the department has implemented or uh, satisfied all of the Maryland Police Accountability Act mandates. I would like to confirm that that's actually true. Um, it should not be that difficult to do. Um, I think just basically a list of the requirements and when those uh, mandates were uh, satisfied, I think would be also be very helpful. Um, so a lot of stuff for the police to uh, get back to us on, but I think this is all very good background information that will help inform our work and uh, it aligns, at least in my view, uh, right with our work plan and what we are expecting us to work on going forward for the next several months. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Donahue, all duly noted. Um, I, I was going to share that I, I was invited um, uh, to represent the ACP along with um, a number of other community uh, organizations um, to meet a candidate uh, for the position of um, police chief. And so with that, you know, I took, uh, we did send a letter um, uh, to the county executive uh, asking, you know, I think we had five, five or six particular issues that we wanted to address. And so I took those with me to the meeting to um, uh, ask those questions. Um, uh, uh, at, in another setting, I think I'm pretty, I'm positive, Susan, that they will, we will all have the opportunity um, to engage um, a potential candidate. But uh, this particular candidate uh, was very vocal about their passions with regards to constitutional policing. Um, 
And so if if you're familiar with that, it's it's um utilizing um uh well constitutional policing provides a framework to ensure fair and impartial and effective uh enforcement of the law that is consistent with constitutional principles, uh democratic values and community expectations. Um uh the the the, the candidate also shared their commitment to um uh, preventing bias. Uh, there's lots of experience. Um, so we look forward to that person then uh, getting out to the general public and to other meetings. Uh, Ms. Branson uh, was also at the meeting representing another organization. I don't know if you want to chime in here. Um, yeah. Yes. yeah, I'm happy to. I was at the meeting um, representing the NAACP. Um, and, and I should also add that uh, there were two meetings that week. I think, mm -hmm. I, I can't remember if we went on Monday or Tuesday, but then there was another Monday. group mm -hmm. that was on Thursday. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know that was a lot, uh, that was, I don't, can't say a lot. I, I think there were several advocacy type groups yeah. that were included in that meeting. So um, what I can say and the, um, in, in the our PAB meeting, was represented was, as well. I'm sorry, the PAB was represented. When, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And it was um, in in our group. There were also representatives of of the business community. Mm -hmm. Um. So um, what I can say is that no, while we have not received a formal response, it it seems as though we were heard and action was taken in furtherance of our concerns. Um, and, but I, I, I share Mr. Donahue's um, uh, concern that, um, that, you know, part of our concern was not, was, uh, uh, to me, our concern was twofold, that the public should, should be, that there should be public engagement. Uh, so it, it seems that that there was an effort to invite, you know, representatives of the public, I guess you could say. Um, but but I think our, our concern was also about um, meeting with this bot. Um, and, and that part, you know, really has has not been addressed. Um, so so I I hear you and, and I agree with you. And I would add to what uh, Reverend Bellamy said um, about what this candidate talked about. Um, he also talked about adding community engagement mm -hmm. in the officer's daily, you know, time log, mm -hmm. which um, had been um, a, um, a, a, a concern for many of us who, you know, who, who want the police to not just show up at bad stuff. Um, but who who want the police to show up when, you know, just to to know people on the block? Um, so um, I, I would um, I, that's that's all I I, I want to and and I, I I totally support Mr. Donahue's request that we received the that we receive the most recent uh, what is it C Kalia is that how you say it C A LEA, the accreditation report. Correct. That, that we we request that because because I think that that would be very um, enlightening. Agreed. All right. Um, any other any other questions or thoughts before we close out tonight, or any other business? All right. Thank you, everyone, for. Uh, your time and attention to these matters. Uh, we look forward to talking um, and communicating in between the next meeting and meeting, uh, hopefully in June. Uh, can we get a motion to dismiss? Motion to adjourn. Motion to Second. adjourn. It's been moved and second that we uh, adjourn this meeting at 8, 10 p.m. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Aye. aye. All opposed, stay logged in and have a good night. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank you, too. All right. Thank you.